Good morning, church family. Come on, stand to your feet with us. And it's been too long since I've gotten to say that. We're looking forward to worshiping with you today. I believe the Lord's going to come and do something special in this place. So just position yourself to receive. This is going to be good. Here we go. Come on.
when darkness tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own and when brokenness and shame is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken it's my Stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand.
This last song that we chose to do this morning intentionally, it's something that we showed you um, over our live stream services, and it's been good just singing it out as a worship team, but there's just been something super special over these last two services that we've done in here as we just begin to uh, just declare the blessing. Uh, it's one thing just to sing something, but it goes to a whole other level whenever you're just getting to kind of sing out scripture, and then you take it even to another point when you're actually getting to see the faces of the people that you love so much that you're getting to declare that blessing over. And there's just, this is a family song. This is one of those things that uh, I know Lauren and I, we love just praying this over our kids at night, and then just when we come in together in a place like this, and you guys are declaring blessing over the people around you, the, those of us up on stage here, and we're pouring it back out on you guys, there's just a synergy that happens, and there's power and unity, and there's a blessing, and I love, there's kind of a, a different phrase in there where it just says, and your children, and your children, and your children, and somebody was saying, you know, it just seems a little redundant, but that's really the word of God. That's the character and nature of God that, you know, it talks about the curse going for seven generations, but the blessing of God has no end, that we are still reaping the blessings of our forefathers people that you read about in the bible we are carrying on and enjoying the blessings that they receive today god's blessing is here and it's here for you and so we're just going to sing this together if you recognize it sing it out if you don't it's a pretty easy song you'll be able to catch it pretty quick but here we go sound good. Come on, say it again. The Lord bless. The Lord bless you today and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and that say I'm in. Shine upon you, be great. 
thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you good to be back in God's house this morning. You know, you watch the news and they say we weren't going to make it through this thing, but here we are because God is faithful. Amen. And they keep talking about how big and bad this thing is, but I just want to tell them, I serve the great I am. 
I serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And they say this thing's unprecedented, but I'm going to tell you, like I told first service, we serve the God of the unprecedented. Amen. And we can come in here and we don't have to be fearful. We can have church this morning and not be afraid one bit. Amen. And that's what we're going to do. We are so glad to see you. You look awesome. You look so good. I'm going to tell you, you look a lot better than that ugly camera back there. We've been having to stare at that thing. And we are so glad to see you. It's just refreshing to see you in this place. And normally I get to tell you to walk around and greet folks. I can't tell you that today. But if you can just air high five or wave at somebody, wave your leg, whatever you do, just do something, all right? Well, good morning, church family, all of you who are here and those that still are watching at home with your PJs on. We have people here with pants on. We're glad to be in the house of the Lord, and however you're joining us today, we are glad that you're joining us. We believe, and, and I do believe this, that God has a message just for you today. Amen? Amen. Jesus was asking an important question one day, and you all know the answer. If you've come to church any number of days, you know the answer to this question. What's the greatest commandment? And he answered the question simply this way, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And he says second of equal importance is to love your neighbor as yourself. You know, we, we view that later on in Luke, he talks about the lilies being taken care of. And he talks about not worrying about food or clothing, that God will take care of all those. And then he says this, seek first the kingdom of God and God will take care of all your needs. You know, we're here today and we were here last evening uh, and we were here earlier this morning. Uh, and honestly, we made a decision this week as a church family and staff that if we had the opportunity to have church, we were going to have church. Amen. And what we said was this, it doesn't matter how little people show up or how many people show up, that it was important for us to honor God and put him first. Somebody say amen. amen. Because I can tell you this about me, I know it's about you as well, we're a little into this one day, and Shelly said, where are you going? She said, I'm going to the store. She said, you're going to the store? I said, I would, re I would rather get COVID-19 than starve to death. <laughs> you say, there's not a chance of that happening, Pastor. It didn't. I'm just guaranteeing you that. And why I say that is this, as it relates to those scriptures we oftentimes take care of our physical needs first. But the word of God tells us, put God first. Put him in the first place. Listen to me, no condemnation today, but I believe this. If you can get out and take care of yourself and go to HEB, you ought to be able to put God first and come to church. You say, that sounded like a condemning statement, not meant to be at all. I'm talking about how we put God first in every part of our life. We put him first in every part to say, this is where you're first. You understand he wants to be first in our giving as well. That before we pay anything else that we say, God, the first part belongs to you. And that's what he's, he's accepted from the very beginning. From the time that, that, that you had those Adam's boys fighting over each other and one kills the other. And he, God accepts one sacrifice and one that is not. Cain and Abel, that we understand God accepted the first and the best. And so today, we get, we're going to have a time of giving. You can give online today, and I encourage you to do so, encourage all you guys to do so. We're not going to pass the big blue buckets. Somebody say amen. Our ushers have germs. I didn't say it was COVID-19. They have something. I don't know. 
And so we're not passing the bucket, but you can certainly, they'll be at the door when you leave today. If you'd like to leave a check, you can, you can put that in there uh, and be blessed when you do so. In just a moment, we're going to pray. I'm going to ask that you join, stand up one more time with me. I made a new practice of things uh, in this time. I believe with all of my heart that God desires to bless you. Now, how many of you would like to be blessed? So if someone gives you a gift, do you say, oh, no, 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 I don't want that. If I came and gave you a new car today, would you say, oh, pastor, I can't accept that from you. You, you would be refusing a blessing, wouldn't you? That I wanted to bless you and you said, oh, no, I can't receive that. Did you know that oftentimes God wants to bless us and we're rebuffing his blessings? You say, pastor, how do we do that? By not receiving the blessing. So in this time, what we've done is that I, I get, I, I can't take all the mail and when the checks come in and I open, if somebody sent a check in their tithe and offering, you know what I say? God bless John. I'm praying a blessing over your house. When I get the report that you've given online, you know what I go through that port and I say, uh, God, God bless Calvin and his family. What I'm saying is in the midst of even what's going on in the world, God wants to bless you. You know how I know that? I want you to look around. You see there's new floor in this sanctuary. How many of you see these new beautiful chairs? How many of you noticed that when you came in? Did you know in the midst of all this, all of this is paid for in full? No special offerings, nothing. You said, Pastor, you made a promise, said we're getting new chairs. We got new chairs. We don't have the old germy ones. <laughs> no germs on these. These are brand new chairs. We took them out of the plastic. The floor no longer has that old nasty carpet. John took it all up. He can tell you it was nasty. I said after he took it up, I said, I'll never have carpet any other place ever again. Uh, and, and a beautiful floor. You understand what I'm saying? God can bless even in the midst, and God wants to bless you. So even as we enter the word today, let's pray. Father, we come. We want to put you first in everything. In our life, in our giving. That, Lord, no matter what, we want to say, God, you are number one. So, Lord, I ask that you take our money today and you bless it, that we might bless others. We're made in your image and likeness, and you are a great blesser, and we want to be a great blessing to all those around us. And so, Lord, multiply what we've given to be a blessing to others. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, most importantly, this is our third service this weekend, and just let me kind of give you an update of where we're headed. Next weekend is Mother's Day weekend. We decided as a staff that it would be better not to have a trial run of how things go, not on Mother's Day weekend. So next weekend, we will have church service. You say, Pastor, what does that mean? And we made a commitment this weekend and letting everyone know that you didn't get out this weekend, it's okay. Next weekend, the church is going to be here and we're going to be open. And our commitment as a staff is this, is that we're going to do as many services as necessary to accommodate God's people. You say, Pastor, that seems like a lot of work. It can be a lot of work, but I'm going to tell you something. We believe it's that important. We believe us getting out and honoring God first above all things is that important. And we're willing to help you in doing that. And so what that means is we will continue next weekend with a Saturday night service. Uh, more than likely, we'll publish the schedule this week, but more than likely, we will start out with three Sunday morning services next weekend. Uh, that way we can honor not only God, but we can come and honor our moms next week. Amen. And honor their faith and honor their prayers. And we're going to have a special gift for all of our moms. And once again, we'll make it by reservation. So you can even tell your friends and neighbors, if you'll make a reservation and we know you're coming, that gives us the, the ability to understand. We don't want to pile so many people in here that the press is out on our doors, knocking on the door saying, man, can you believe that that church has... Uh, 500 people stacked in there on top of each other. We're not going to do that. We're going to be wise, amen? We're going to be wise so we can continue to meet together in God's presence. And so just know that we are committed. We're here for you. We know that you're going through all kinds of interesting things in this time. Uh, and we want, we want to be 
the church that serves you. And so we're going to do that as far as that goes next weekend. And we're going to honor our moms next weekend. So make plans to be with us. Well, I've got a very special message today. Before I get to it, though, I'm really excited about sharing some jokes to live people. And I found some great jokes about this whole lockdown during this quarantine. In fact, some people are using the word lockdown because they don't know how to spell quarantine. One guy said, I've absorbed so much disinfectant, soap, and antibacterial sanitizing gels recently that whenever I go to the bathroom, it cleans the toilet. Here's a word of warning for all of you today. If you get an email with the subject line saying, knock, knock, don't open it. It's a Jehovah Witness working from home. <laughs> you know that was good, don't you? Let me talk to you about who I am and why we're here this weekend. We live in a world where oftentimes... We don't know so, but we cross into areas that God never intended us to cross into. We don't know the boundaries. Because we live in a time and a place where everybody becomes an expert about everything because there is so much information. So I'm here to tell you today, first and foremost, before we ever even start this message about what I'm not. <laughs> Number one, and everybody can say amen in this one, I'm not a politician. How about that? I'm not here to garner your votes today or have a popularity contest or see what it is or have an agenda. I have no hidden agenda today. I'm not a politician and I'm not going to talk about politicians today. How about that? Nor am I a doctor or a disease specialist. Now, my, my wife may argue that particular because I've read a lot of information probably more than most. In fact, I was riding with somebody the other day and they were talking about something uh, and I made a correction and because I've read a lot of stuff and I said, no, that's not what it is. And this is what it is. And he said, wow, you know a lot about this. I have, but I'm no, by no means am I an expert. I didn't go to medical school. Somebody say amen. And I have nothing but a really uninformed opinion. Honestly, when it's all said and done, only God knows the truth about all this. Somebody say amen. L lastly, uh, and I think most importantly, I'm not a financial guru. I, I can't tell you what's going to happen with the economy. Uh, I, I can tell you that everybody will be impacted or affected on some level. Somebody say amen. But there's nothing to be scared of because God always takes care of his people. Somebody say amen. And so I was thinking about the kind of message I wanted to preach as we open back up. And God began speaking to me this week. Because my responsibility as a pastor is this, number one. Throughout what's been going on these last six weeks, my number one responsibility in God's calling on my life is not to pastor a building. It's not to oversee a budget. My responsibility as a pastor, with God's help, is to encourage and enable faith. You say, Pastor, why is that so important? Because the Word of God tells us, Hebrews eleven six, it is impossible to please God without faith. Now, I have people that are here with me, so we can all be a part of this. Everybody say, impossible with me. Impossible. It's impossible to please God without faith. In other words, you say, well, isn't righteousness important? Righteousness is important, but you can't be righteous without faith. Isn't holiness important? Holiness is important, but you can't be holy without faith. A relationship with God is certainly important. But can I tell you something? You can't have a relationship with God without faith. And so it's impossible to please God without faith. Now, I've heard some people say in this crisis, they said, well, I believe this crisis will help people return to faith. And, and I want to just tell you about potential versus reality. Is there potential that a crisis can help return people to faith? Certainly. Yes. But let me talk to you about potential. Because everyone here, I used to hate that word growing up, by the way. 
I, 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 guess it, I guess it's because that's what all my teachers would write on my report card. Alan has such potential. <laughs> that wasn't necessarily a good positive thing. See, we have the potential here to better ourselves. We can get more education. We have the potential at some rate to earn more money. You know, there's some people who get multiples of jobs. We have that potential. We have the potential to eat right and exercise. You know, like you, I've been on the seafood diet. If I see it the last six weeks, I eat it. Uh, and, and my exercise has been going back and forth to the refrigerator and uh, saying that my stomach is gnawing on itself and I need something else right now. And Shelly said, you are going to be as big as a barn. But I said, I'm going to be a happy barn. <laughs> and so what we understand is a crisis certainly creates opportunity. But it doesn't guarantee faith. We're in the midst of a faith opportunity. Uh, and with God's help, it's my job to reach out and help you reach your faith potential. See, a crisis doesn't build faith. People who overcome crisis build faith. Let me say it again. A crisis doesn't build faith. People who overcome crisis build faith. And so the question we're going to address this morning is that am I overwhelmed or am I overcoming? And for us to understand how to go forward and where we're at in this great transition, we have to recognize the enemy. And you might be one of those people who come to church and you say, Pastor, that's a pretty simple answer. It's the enemy, it's the devil. The word of God says he comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But amazingly enough, he uses one tactic all the time. Because you understand something, if faith pleases God then there has to be an opposite of faith. What doesn't please God? Fear. And fear is always the enemy of our faith. That when we walk in fear, it's nearly impossible to walk in faith. And if faith is the only thing that pleases God, you understand something. We have a problem when we walk in fear. And so we have to address the proverbial elephant in the room today, and we have to talk about, in the midst of this crisis, what has been the utmost of propaganda is to put people into a place of fear. In fact, last night, I was about to get up here and share. Jonathan was sitting next to me. By the way, last night, and we will do so again next week, we had, we had a safe place for all of our 50 and older congregation. I know some of you are in that age group, and you just don't want to admit it. You're certainly welcome to come on Saturday night and be here with us. But I was about to come up, and as I, I was about to come up, how many of you get notifications on your phone? I told Jonathan I'm turning all of the notifications on my phone because... As I'm about to step up here, news alert. The latest fatality rate for COVID-19. Or how about this one? The state is reopening and we've had more deaths than what we've ever had since the beginning. Really. And we are getting inundated with fear. We're being inundated with fear. And there needs to be a reminder, a good reminder today about who we are, that we are the people of God. Somebody say amen. And we are people of faith. And so we're going to deal with this issue today, and we're going to look to Scripture. If you have your Bible, turn me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. You say, Pastor, I know that passage. You're going to talk about a little shepherd boy defeating a giant. Not really. I'm going to talk to you about what happened before a little shepherd boy defeated a giant. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse number 1, it says, The Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped between Soko and Judah and Azekah at Ephesidim. 
Saul encountered, countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and the Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. Now, if we were to stop right there and not read any further any on, this is what we could come to a safe assumption. You've got the army of the Israelites bunkering down on this hill. You've got the Philistines bunkering down on this hill. And so there is going to be a battle down in this valley. And there's going to be someone who wins the battle and someone who loses the battle. That's the only reason two armies gather together. How many of you say that's a safe assumption? They have garnered, they have equipped themselves, they have armed themselves, they are ready for battle, and you have two armies on either side, and the safe assumption is there's going to be a great battle here. Then, Goliath. A Philistine champion from Gath came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He wore bronze leg armor, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked, be, walked ahead of him carrying a shield. And Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are all of you coming out to fight? He called. I am the Philistine champion. But you are only the servants of Saul. Now let's stop there. Are they only the servants of Saul? Oh, hold on. Are these God's covenant people? Do they carry the presence of God? Do they carry the blessing of God? Are they just servants of Saul? Hmm. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. I read this passage this week, and honestly, I have heard this story since I was little itty, itty, bitty, but as I read this story again, I said, this doesn't make any sense. I mean, you understand what fear does to you. This doesn't make any sense. How can one man come out and put the terms of engagement for a whole battle? How can he tell a whole army, this is how we're going to play today, and this is how you're going to play, and you're going to play by my rules, and how can the people of God that follow God and that know God's blessing accept it? How does that happen? How does a giant come out of nowhere and say, these are the new rules of battle? And everybody says, oh, okay. And we live in a world where rules are being changed. And we live in a world where the people of God are being called something else. And if we're not careful, we can become like Saul and the Israelites. Do you know what they did? Let's, let's carry on. See, fear is the greatest enemy of faith. And the first point today is fear overwhelms, disables, and steals life. Verse 16, let me read it to you. It might sound familiar for you. For 40 days... Every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. And if you will read on, it says, every day they ran away and hid. Last night as I was talking to our 50 plus crew, I said, I don't have to tell you guys how precious time is. 
Someone once told me life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer it gets to the end, the faster it goes. Forty days, husbands are away from wives. Forty days, dads are away from their children. Forty days, the economy goes still. Forty days, nothing happens in Israel. Listen to me. Because one man defies and holds up a country. Forty days, everything comes to a standstill because one guy set the rules. Now, I want to ask you a question. Here's the logical thing. Couldn't have Israel got a secret posse of Israelite seals and went over there and killed him at night? Some kind of plan, isn't it? Or how about just rushing the guy? You, you have a whole regiment of people say he's just one guy and we got a hundred of us. Let's go take him. I think a hundred guys could have taken one giant. But every day for 40 days, 40 days, they just scatter and hide away until a little shepherd boy comes with a different perspective. What do you think you guys are doing? And how can you let him talk to you like that? We're the people of God. And here's the crazy part of this whole story. Not just that a shepherd boy takes on the giant, but warriors encourage him to do so. They shove him on the battlefield knowing he has less experience than they do. How? Listen to me. How does that happen? And we understand fear puts us in such a bondage that sometimes, listen to me, it seems unbreakable. It seems overwhelming and unbreakable. Here's the second one. I know that some of you will agree and some of you watching today will agree with this as well. Fear distracts and steals right thinking. That all of a sudden, you're not thinking like the people of God. You're thinking like everybody else. And when they say run, guess what you do? You run. When they say hide, what do you do? You hide. I understand that there's been a lot of fear in this and a lot of misinformation, a lot of things going out there. And you say, Pastor, are you questioning the legitimacy of this virus? I am not. I personally know people, friends of mine, that have passed away from this virus. So by no means am I undermining uh, the legitimacy of this virus. It is very real. But as real as the virus is, is the fear that it has created. Not just in the world as we know it, that's being inundated by propaganda and information day after day after day, that we begin hiding away. And we lose all rationale. I mean, you understand the crazy part of this. It wasn't up until two weeks ago, Walmart had a lot more people in it than we have in here today. I, you understand, the line at HEB and inside HEB up to a couple of weeks ago, there were a lot more people than there are here today. And you were like me. You were going to the store because you weren't going to starve to death. And then there are other people I say, they say, well, we're going to stay at self-quarantine. And yet somebody in their household is going to work encountering people every day and coming home. Can I ask you what kind of sense that makes? They're bringing back everybody else's stuff with them. You, you don't have the equipment to your house to spray them down and to wear masks. You, you understand something. Fear, all of a sudden, we don't become rational anymore. So we cloister ourselves and we think that I can control this. And here's the silly part. How many of you here today are Christians? Can I see your hands? Let me tell you what the Word of God says about your life. You ready for this? The Word of God says that God has numbered your days. 
And so what you're telling me is you've outmaneuvered God and you figured out a way to make it last longer. <laughs> We're really that smart. That we have outmoded. He said, well, I believe God has everything in control. He's the maker and creator of all things. He sent his son Jesus to die for my sins. But you know what? I can do the end around on him and live longer. Didn't when we gave, gave our heart and life to Jesus Christ, we gave our heart and life to Jesus Christ? If we can trust him in death, which I hope that we do, we certainly ought to be able to trust him in life. And we can't allow the devil to steal our identity through fear. A whole army became immobilized because they believed they were just followers of Saul and they had forgotten they were the chosen people of God. They could have went, went out and, listen to me, they could have went out and won that battle in 15 minutes and been, been home with their children and family enjoying great times. But 40 days until a little shepherd boy comes along and changes everything. See, fear distracts and it steals right thinking. Number three, fear enables compromise. Now, I want you to hear what I'm about to say because this is important. I just told you God's covenant people are being held hostage by a giant. Fear stole the people of God's purpose and calling. Now, this is important because I think we all need to understand this again. Did you know that during the Nazi regime, starting in the 30s and going through World War II, did you know that most Germans were not Nazis. Most of the German people were not Nazis. In fact, most of the German people didn't agree with any of the Nazis' philosophies. Were you aware of that fact? But do you know why they were a party to killing over 10 million innocent people? Fear. They were afraid. They were afraid for their lives. They were afraid for their children. They were afraid for their future. They had seen what this tyrannical uh, leader would do. He would come in and, and just execute people at will. And so they walked in complete fear. And when they would smell those smells of that burning flesh coming from those camps, they just turned around and acted like it never was happening. All because of fear. See, fear can be dangerous. It can be extremely dangerous to our being. And the compromise of our faith is, and I have to ask you the question today, and I, I loved what Pastor Calvin said, don't we serve a big God? No, wait a minute. Don't we serve a big God? Wait a minute, I'm going to ask a question because I need your help because those people out there watching today need your help. Don't we serve a big God? Yes. Isn't he bigger than this disease? Yes. Really, isn't he bigger than this disease? Yes. And yet we've inundated ourselves with the wrong information. We find ourselves fleeing like everyone else. Now, here, here's, here's the quote of the day, and you can write it down, and if you're watching, I hope that you'll make this a practice. We can't afford to quit living because we're afraid of dying. We can't afford to quit living because we're afraid of dying. So let me tell you today how we can kill the giant. By no means, if you're watching today, by no means... Uh, am I trying to anger you or make you feel condemned? That's not the case at all. I want you to understand today that there's a great enemy that goes beyond even this disease, and that great enemy is fear. Fear takes us places that we don't want to go and eventually will lead us to sin. You say, Pastor, I don't believe fear is a sin. Fear is a sin. For a man to know what to do right and he doesn't do it, to that man it's sin. You understand if faith is the only thing that pleases God and fear is the enemy of faith, wouldn't fear be a sin? 
Because fear robs our purpose and plan and everything that God created us for and everything he sent his son to die for. It's all been stolen from us. Fear is a great enemy and it's a great thief. You say, Pastor, how do we kill the giant? How do we overcome fear? Three quick points today. Number one, daily. Everybody say daily with me because it's important. In fact, I should have highlighted that there. I should have underlined it because it needs to be understood daily. How many of you hear the news daily? Can I see your hands? How many of you hear the news daily? If we're going to build our faith daily, we need to renew our relationship with God. It's not enough to wait for the church doors to open. Somebody say amen. We need to daily renew our relationship with God. And that's not just talking, that's listening. Do you know I made a, I made a vow to God and to you as a people that over this time, I was going to every day awaken early and I was going to write a word of encouragement every day. I post it on social media every day. That it doesn't matter if it's Sunday, it doesn't matter if it's Monday, it doesn't matter what I have going on. And I will tell you this, I awaken really early in the morning, and here's the truth. Before I step onto the floor and go into the other room, God has already spoken to me and given me the word. You say, well, it must be just because of the grace for this particular season. Can I tell you something? God doesn't change, and he is speaking all the time if we want to listen. But hear what I'm about to say. What pleases God? No, come on. Y'all know the answer to this. What pleases God? So when we are speaking to God out of our fear and we say, he's not talking to me, why is that? Because we're not talking out of faith because it's the only thing that pleases him. When we're coming and telling him, God, this is a horrible situation. And do you know how many people are dying down here? And do you know what's going on, God? How many of you understand that's not faith? What does God respond to? All through the word of God from the very beginning. Even when Jesus was here, what does God respond to? Faith. And so we wonder why God's not responding to us because oftentimes we're not praying out of faith, we're praying out of fear. We have to hit the ground running every day and say, God, I need a word from you because I need my faith to be built because this world needs hope. Our neighbors need hope. Our families need hope. They need something beyond what everybody else is saying. And just because I'm reposting what another doctor has a different opinion on, I'm going to tell you something. That's not building anyone's faith. We're just adding to the confusion. What people need to understand is live or die we serve a God of, e of forever and ever and ever and ever, and he has made a way for us to live with him forever. And you know what? I'm not scared. Somebody say amen. So we have to daily renew. See, fear leads to sin because it disables our ability to follow God and please him. Number two, we have to quiet all other voices. Just like last night, I said, man, I don't need that kind of notification. I'm about to get up and preach the good news. I'm, I'm about to get up and talk about faith and that they're trying to instill fear in me. We have to quiet all the other voices. You say, Pastor, I have to know what's going on. Can I tell you something? We live in an information society and say, well, I just watch the news for the weather. Can you control it? Are they right most of the time? I'm going to tell you, the news is like the weather. You can't control it, and most of the time it's wrong. So why do you watch it? Can I tell you something? I'm going to live whether it rains today or not. How many of you are going to go about your business whether it rains today or not? You're not going to go outside and say, oh, I can't go home, it's raining outside. 
I've got an air mattress. I mean, we'll set it up for you and you can, you can make camp right here. You have to quiet all of the voices because you understand something? Hear, hear me today, folks. Fear is always building a case. Fear is building a case, and the more evidence we can provide for our fear is the more reason we're going to give people and say, this is why I'm doing this. And everybody has a good reason because they built a good case, but you understand something, fear is not faith. Fear is not faith. You can build a case and say, well, you understand my grandmother's this way and my, my parents, this happened to them. I get it. I understand something. But you're building a case and you'll always find something to reinforce your case. All those guys, you understand, in, in, those, in those trenches that are hiding, they all talked about how big that giant was. Did you see how big he was? Oh, my gosh. How, how do you think that we get such description about even the size of the shaft of his spear? It's, how do you think we got all those descriptions there? Because they talked about them at length. He's nine feet tall. Look at that. Look at that armor he weighs. That has to weigh a ton. There's not a man here that can take on that guy. Nobody ever talked about how big their God was. Nobody ever talked about this is who we are. Nobody ever said, I think 10 of us can go out there and take him. And so for 40 days, they remained in this quagmire. Until a little shepherd boy comes and says, I don't know what you're doing. And they say, okay, we'll let you be the volunteer. We'll talk about that in a minute. Number three, we have to act in faith. And hear me, giants aren't killed with words. First Samuel 17, 45. David replied to the Philistine, and he pardon me if I get a little emotional here. You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. <laughs> you think you're big? You ain't quite as big as what you think you are. You've got all the armor. You've got the reputation. But I am a child of God. I could come at you today with some chopsticks and whoop your butt. The God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. And verse 48, and as Goliath moved closer to attack, look at this. David quickly ran out to meet him. He didn't even wait for the giant to come to him. He ran to the giant. Did you hear what he said? You're really big. You're really scary. You're all these things, but what you don't understand is who I am and who my God is. And the thing is, you don't have a chance today. It's time for the people of God to start talking like the people of God. Is it big and scary? Do we have enough information on the giant? Come on. Do we have enough information on the giant? Do we know what it does? Do we know who it targets? You understand something. Last night we had people over the age of 50, some people well into their 80s here in church. They are the target group, and they know it. And you know what I told them? This generation needs you that have walked through tougher things than this. 
to step up and say, God can handle this. This isn't a biggie for him. See, some of you even here today, you've walked through tougher things than this. You've seen bigger giants than this. Are we going to allow everybody else to talk us into how dominant this giant is? Or are we going to become and be the people of faith that God has called us to be? Today, I believe this message not just to be a message for Life Community Church. I believe this to be a message for lots of people. I believe this is a message for anyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and says, Lord, I've given you my heart and my life. That we trust the good shepherd. And the good shepherd says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of, I will no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Amen. <laughs> Truly, if you know the Good Shepherd, you understand there is nothing to fear. Somebody say amen today. I want to pray. I'm going to pray with those that are here in just a moment. We're going to bow our heads and we're going to close our eyes as we do in church often. But as you're watching online today, maybe you're sitting there and you say, Pastor, I'm overwhelmed by fear for my future, for my children, for my grandchildren. I don't know what to do. Can I tell you something? We have to disavow our fear. You say, Pastor, what does that mean? It's a process of repentance. Disavowing is we recognize that it's there and we recognize that it does not please God. See, that's a recognition. My fear doesn't please God. And I have to come to God and say, God, my fear doesn't please you. And I'm asking you to forgive me and to help me. I place my life in your hands and that big God can be trusted. That's why we're here today. Amen. Bow your heads with me. How many are you here today? And you can honestly say with me, Pastor Allen, I'm dealing with some major fear issues and I really need to disavow my fear today and I really need faith. If that's you, will you raise your hand right now? I want to pray with you right where you're at. Lord bless you. Thank you for that hand. Hands are going up everywhere. I, I, I am disavowing my fear today. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. Let's join together in prayer. God, we believe as the people of God that when we begin talking to you, especially in the name of Jesus, that you turn your ear to us. We don't believe we're talking to air today. We don't believe we're just talking to each other. We truly believe that we are talking to you, the creator of all the universe the redeemer and maker of our lives. And through your son Jesus, we have life and we have abundant life, even in the midst of this mess of a world. And I pray right now over every person, Lord, experiencing great fear today, that you will calm their fear. Literally, right where they're at, supernaturally, I believe that's the kind of God you are. Lord, that they'll come into their right mind. And they'll say, my God is bigger than any of this. And that, Lord, you will lead and guide them and be with them. And that they will know, they will know that they know that they know that you're with them. Lord, I pray, even as we prayed in that song and Tyler so eloquently sang it, I pray the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you. And Lord, may, you, may your presence be real to each and every person that they may know you and that their children might know you from generation to generation. God, as we honor you, will you honor us with your presence? That not only for here, but Lord, as we leave this place today, that we know who you are and we know who we are. And Lord, we don't have to fear today. 
And Lord, we will give and return to you. We will return to you all glory, all honor, and all praise because you're more than deserving of all those things. And we pray these things today in the name of Jesus. Amen.